focus with Ajaz Sahadar. Pakistan is ready to restart talks with De India if Delhi provides a roadmap towards restoring the previous status of occupied Kashmir. This was stated by Prime Minister Imran Khan Khan last Friday while speaking to Reuters wire agency. If there is a roadmap, then yes, we will talk. Even if they give us a roadmap, that these are the steps that we'll take to basically undo what they did, which is illegal against international law and United States Nations resolutions, then that is acceptable. In March, Pakistan deferred a decision by the Economic Coordination Committee to restart trade with India until Delhi reviewed its moves in Kashmir. The decision was announced in a presser by then Finance Minister and got a lot of flack, after which the cabinet reversed it. It also cost the Finance Minister's portfolio, even though the PM, interestingly, in his additional capacity as Commerce and Textile Minister, had signed off on the decision. India has not responded to Khan's interview. To discuss this further, I am joined by Ambassador Tamina Janjua, former Foreign Secretary, and Dr. Rifat Hussain, Head of Public Policy at the University of Science and Technology. Ambassador Janjua, really the point, I mean, the last time after the reversal of this decision to trade with India, there was a clear, uh, you know, sort of, there were statements also saying that we are not going to talk about this until India begins to do certain things. So why this again? Well, well, I guess when you look at the interview, it was the, the, the Reuters interview in which the Prime Minister spoke. The Reuters were probably pushing the Prime Minister in this direction as well. Uh, I completely agree with you that there is, uh, there is just not one strand to the discussion uh, on whether we can start conversations with India or not. The fact remains that one, to start off, India was itself that approached Pakistan to have a conversation, to start some conversation, back, uh, back to conversations with Pakistan. Let's not forget that reality. And then uh, Pakistan, of course, those, those conversations we understand continue, though uh, quite behind the closed doors, and no one knows the details of those conversations. But it appears that India was trying hard, and of course, India would be trying hard considering its current position internationally. It is in a very difficult position. The, the reality of India's governance and the reality of the Indian government is clearly evident to the, to the world, and the, the world is telling India and Modi and the Modi government to move away from the very uh, from the ideological basis of his entire uh, foreign policies. Uh, that, of course, uh, to give uh, India a chance, uh, the the uh, I'm sure the Indian uh, the Indians thought of of uh, starting this back backdoor channel, but frankly speaking, uh, our insistence on talking about talks with India, uh, there are a number of difficulties. Once there one, there is a question of substance. I am not to know. I don't understand why do we have to continue to. Talk about talks. Yes, as as a democratic, open society, we can say that we need to have conversations. But the most important thing is Kashmir, and what has happened in Kashmir is not on the fifth of August. Was not just the the status of of, of a special status being taken away, uh, but there have been many actions that have been taken by India afterwards, and then before that as well. Uh, Kashmir was not in any. Uh, a haven, so to say. There were human rights violations that continued. And now, too, there's enhanced use of lethal force, extrajudicial executions, and, and all types of uh, home demolitions and rep reprisal attacks against journalists and political leaders. And there are alarming measures that are being taken by India to change the demography of the region, going completely against UN Security Council resolutions, which is, which is totally unacceptable to us. So just uh, one strand is go back back uh, to a special status for Jammu and Kashmir. But what about the other strands that need to be looked at? And that's one which we need clarity before we say, yes, we need talks. We need to have talks. Uh, the only reason I understand the prime minister went ahead and said that there we would be ready for talks 
is because he thought that um, as, a, as a democratic nation, we should look like we are ready for talks, but we are doing it in the interest of the Kashmiri people and the Kashmiris. The kind of insults, injuries, humiliations, human rights violations that they are undergoing needs to stop and that's the most important thing. Secondly, we are not quite, I'm not quite sure of the process. There is an opacity and it's the entire process is shrouded in opacity. And that is something we need to know as to what is happening. What are the discussions? I mean, people have been talking about uh, low hanging fruit. Now, what is low hanging fruit is another question, ma'am. I'm not too sure whether Searchin or, or Sir Creek are low hanging fruit. So these things need to be brought in the, brought out in the open. And finally, I continue to believe that this was an opportunity for Pakistan to display to the world the reality of the Indian polity, the reality of Hindutva ideology, which comes not only from RSS, but also predates independence. The fact that Pakistan and India, that Pakistan was created because Jinnah realized the reality of the Indian polity and the, of the Indian leadership at that time and which continues right now and is very strongly manifested in it. So I believe what we need should do right now is to rip apart the reality of, uh, of India and its real face uh, trying to show that it's not an inclusive, tolerant society, but is one in which there is immense intolerance. The world is listening. The world will listen. This is our opportunity to, to, to tell the world and thus gives us an opportunity then to have a discussion, a fair discussion on Kashmir. I couldn't agree more with you on this uh, reference to low-hanging fruit. It's been a long time, and we know that uh, what is described as low-hanging is, is neither uh, <clears throat> neither issue is low-hanging, frankly. Uh, but let me pull in Dr. Hussain here. Uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, give me your perspective on this, uh, the interview, and uh, the fact that we seem to have been sort of flip-flopping. Uh, with reference to uh, our position on Kashmir and also talks, and then we can get to certain specifics. Original principle position that Pakistan had taken that India's August two nine two thousand nineteen act. Uh, uh, was illegal, was, uh, was uh, against the international law, and, uh, and it's not acceptable to Pakistan. And more so, I think the, the uh, India, when it took the August, uh, August 5th, 2019 uh, steps, it tried to annex virtually uh, uh, the entire Jammu and Kashmir, which is disputed territory, and absorbed it into the Indian Union. So that should be the focus of Pakistan's discussion. Uh, and of course, in that context, the Article 35A is very important because by virtue of this article, the Indians are, according to the latest report, are trying to settle, you know, at least bring in 2.5 million Hindus. Uh, most of them belong to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, BGP and trying to settle them in Kashmir. So this policy, uh, of annexation uh, 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 of uh, Jammu and Kashmir should be the focus of Pakistan's uh, discussion. Of course, we must uh, uh, keep this thing in mind that, you know, who's the aggressor in this case? It's the Indian forces, 900 million uh, uh, military presence, uh, Indian troops who have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, given a carte blanche uh, to kill, to maim, to hurt, and you know, denial of Kashmiri's rights. So that should be the focus of our diplomacy. And if and until and unless India agrees to undo what it did in August 2019, and uh, it agrees to reverse the the annexation of of, uh, of Kashmir into the Indian uh, to Indian occupied territory into the Indian Union, we should not be we should not be uh, offering any kind of talks. Uh, the government's position, or at least the sources, their position was that the prime minister was saying, well, uh, you know, you have to read it, uh, the, the sentence in full, which is essentially that India has to basically undo what they did. Uh, and what they did is illegal, it's against international law and United Nations resolution. So if the Indians give us a roadmap saying that they are, these are the steps that they're going to take to undo this, then that could become the basis for talks. 
But uh, Ambassador Jinjua, there's another point uh, which I think uh, needs to be uh, reiterated. And it's not talked about enough, although the Prime Minister has on a couple of occasions talked about the Kashmiris being uh, the central party to this dispute. Isn't it important that we also take certain measures to push the Kashmiris uh, and to make them the thin end of this wedge uh, and get them uh, not just rhetorically, but uh, for them to be a party to any, any talks? Pakistan's continuous position is a, and a principal position has been that Kashmiris are an important party to the discussions that relate to Jammu and Kashmir. And therefore, of course, we need to work with the Kashmiris to see how this can move forward. Now, unfortunately, there is uh, what India is up to is completely, in, it has incarcerated all in Kashmiri leadership in jails and uh, has also unfortunately by attrition a lot of the leadership is is sort of also unfortunately unwell like Gilani Saab not well and Arshav Serai was died in uh, in custody which has been claimed by uh, Pakistan as custodial killing because he died of COVID and was not given the kind of uh, medical assistance that was required Yes, we need to see how the Kashmiris can come together and they need to, but and for that, I have repeatedly said that the Kashmiri diaspora has to play a very important role because at the end of the day, it's Kashmiris that have to uh, have a conversation with both Pakistan and India and we have consistently held this position that the Kashmiris form an important part of the conversation. And we have to work with the Kashmiris to see how to move that forward. The situation in Kashmir, we have seen in the past couple of few weeks how the entire world coalesced around Palestine and was able to get some work done in the UN General Assembly, despite the, the, the problems within the Security Council. Now, we need to work with the Kashmiris outside and see if they can influence the entire international diaspora, the international community in this regard. We need a very concerted um, strategy, journalist strategy, and strategy based on working with journalists and academics to expose the reality of what is happening in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you so much. That was Ambassador Tamina Janjua speaking with us. Uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, talking about the uh, internal issues, I mean, of course, that's, that's a very important uh, area, which, uh, or areas, I would say, include, where we have to sort of get our act together. But uh, keeping sort of, you know, being, I'm, I'm just trying to be parsimonious here, but just staying close to the foreign policy thrust, uh, perhaps there is need to uh, identify exactly what we want to do and then both in statements and purpose to stick to that. Well, I absolutely agree with you, Ajaz. As I mentioned in my earlier comment that Pakistan needs a clarity. What is it that we want from India in terms of Kashmiri people's rights and Kashmiri people's future? Once that decision has been made, then we need to evolve a, uh, a strategy how to pursue that goal. And uh, while uh, you know we can uh, talk about the role of media and the role of the intellectuals and all that, but you know th that should be the focus. And my uh, two cents opinion is very very clear that a that India must undo uh, August uh, uh, 19 decision along with it's a uh, decision to absorb and annex Kashmir. So, uh, and, and you know, uh, not uh, deal with Jammu and Kashmir as, as an Indian territory or as an internal matter. That is something we need to challenge very, 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 very head on. And if Indian government shows some flexibility in terms of his, uh, in terms of his willingness to do something about these issues, so, so there should be. We should welcome that dialogue. And India is a India is 
is known to have backed down from the given commitments, whether those commitments relate to the Shimla Agreement, whether those commitments relate to the uh, LOC ceasefire, and you know, and whether those commitments relate to searching Glacier, and you know, I could go on and on. There's an uh, there's a long list of Indian betrayal of promises that it has made to the Kashmiri people and to, and, to, and to Pakistan and to the international community. So we should be calling out these India, India's contradictions, India's past behavior as a way of trying to focus, remain focused on Kashmir. Right. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Rifat Hussain speaking with us. Joining me now is Gohar Gilani, an eminent Kashmiri journalist and author of Kashmir, Rage and Reason. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gilani, for being on the program. Uh, give me your impression of what you think of Prime Minister Imran Khan's interview to Reuters and what he said about talks with India. Talks, there is no problem in having talks. Uh, you know, people do want India and Pakistan to engage with each other. Uh, like on the ground, there is uh, this massive support for any negotiations. But uh, they, uh, their only concern is about the terms of reference and, uh, you know, terms for those negotiations on what uh, conditions those negotiations are held. As for us, the idea of dialogue, the idea of negotiations, I think there is, uh, you know, massive support that people do want Pakistan and India to engage, but uh, they want to have uh, the rights, political and human rights of Kashmiri, Kashmiris on, on the table. Absolutely. Um, I, I think the, the foreign minister had clarified uh, what he uh, said uh, with reference to 370. Uh, the government sources that I spoke with, uh, and I was talking to other panelists also with reference to that before you joined in, um, uh, you know, I was talking to them uh, about this whole issue of the roadmap. And their contention is that the minister basically meant that India has to undo what it did, uh, and talked about it as being illegal, as being against international law and the UN resolutions. And so those are the steps that India has to take. And that is uh, what he meant by reference to a roadmap. So according to the government sources, the position remains unchanged. Uh, see, uh, Mr. Heather, I have great uh, respect for your knowledge and your analysis, uh, and, and I don't need to repeat uh, that. Uh, I have been following your pieces that you write for the Friday Times also. Uh, but, you know, as we speak, uh, there is Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, India's prime minister, is going to address his nation uh, at 5 p.m., and uh, there are a lot of rumors and speculations which are very rife in Kashmir at the moment because there are, there are reports about heavy troop deployment in northern parts of Kashmir, especially in the Handwara and Kupwara region. Uh, the media reports uh, say that more than 200 companies of Indian paramilitary central have been deployed in these regions. And there are also reports um, you know, that there is similar troop deployment in Kulgam in South Kashmir and Badrwa in uh, the Chenab Valley. So uh, there are four speculations that are doing rounds to lose communications like we did uh, in, in, uh, during last August uh, in 2019. Uh, and second is that uh, they are going to go ahead with the delimitation process. And the speculation is the two districts of some South Kashmir, especially Kulgam and Anantanag, could be merged with Ramban district of Jammu and make it part of uh, the Jammu province to take away the political centrality of the Kashmir Valley and uh, reduce it to mere, you know, uh, insignificant political entity in terms of electoral and political, uh, you know, uh, political terms. And the fourth speculation is that they are going to return statehood to Jammu and leave Kashmir as a union territory. And now the meeting of uh, chief secretary, including the lieutenant general, uh, lieutenant governor, uh, Mr. Manoj Sinha, and all the deputy commissioners of all the districts and all the SSPs and all uh, the police chiefs, the DGP, director general of police, and also the inspector general of police are going to have a virtual meeting with uh, the uh, you know, Indian prime minister, and there is a lot of panic right now in Kashmir. And there are lots of groups on Clubhouse who are like young generation. They are discussing what would happen. And it could be a similar situation that we were left with 
uh, in August 2019. And there are concerns. I mean, people are saying th this Kashmir is not about making moral, political and human rights arguments because then the case would have been won long back in uh, 1948 at the UN. This is about political power. This is about action. And they also draw comparisons with Palestinian uh, struggle and say that Palestinian struggle has this massive, massive international support and many, many UN resolutions which recognize their statehood and also the Palestinian Authority. But still, their conflict also remains unresolved, like Kashmir. So why are we focusing so much on awareness campaigns? Why is there so much of focus on diplomatic uh, you know, uh, arguments? Uh, and it is when, when the main issue is about power, and if somebody has the political will to change the status quo, and when India did uh, change the status quo in August 2019. Thank you so much, Gorgilani, as always, for your insights. We shall take a short break and return to discuss rising tensions between Islamabad and Kabul following an inciting speech by Afghan NSA Ahmadullah Mohib. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Pakistan has decided to bypass Afghan National Security Advisor Ahmadullah Mohib from official discussions with Kabul with reference to the peace process. Mohib had made an inciting speech last month accusing Pakistan of supporting the Taliban. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has also reacted sharply to Mohib's remarks, some of which were downright unparliamentary. I want to ask Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani, on the one hand, you're asking Pakistan to help, but on the other, your employee levels allegations against Pakistan and criticizes the Pakistani institutions. For God's sake, what do you want? Make up your minds, Qureshi was quoted as saying. In a recent interview to Reuters, Prime Minister Imran Khan also reiterated Pakistan's position on Afghanistan, stressing that Pakistan is deeply invested in peace in that country. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Zayed Hussain, eminent journalist and author, most recently, of No Win War, The Paradox of U.S.-Pakistan Relations and Afghanistan's Shadow, and Rahimullah Yusuf Zai, a resident editor of the news and one of the most incisive analysts on Afghanistan. Let me begin with uh, Rahimullah Yusuf Zai here. Uh, so Yusuf Zai, uh, Hamdullah Moheb uh, has always been uh, talking against Pakistan. As a matter of fact, if I recall back in January 2020, on a visit to India, he had privately uh, talked about and, as a matter of fact, requested the Indian authorities to send at least a brigade-level uh, uh, force uh, into Afghanistan, uh, which obviously the Indians did not take very seriously at that time. But my point being that Mohib uh, has always, along with Amrullah Saleh and some others, has not really been, uh, you know, working uh, on the same frequency as the, as the one, uh, you know, other principles have been working on in, you know, in order to sort of advance the peace process also and to uh, make relations work. Yes, I agree. You know, Alhamdulillah Saleh is a younger fellow compared to, with the previous National Security Advisor Hanif Atumar, who was mature and who is now the acting foreign minister. Uh, you know, this has happened to Mohib the second time. Earlier, the U.S. also boycotted him when he gave a very provocative statement while visiting the U.S. that uh, Zalmay Khalilzad is trying to become the viceroy of Afghanistan by engaging with Taliban and by seeking their support. And then the U.S. State Department announced they will no longer be dealing with Alhamdulillah Mohib. You know, I think, uh, you know, this, this was uh, the first time, and now Pakistan has done that. It is the right decision because, you know, uh, if he makes these kind of statements and he's the national security advisor to the president, then we can say that maybe the president also has the same views, but he's not saying it himself, uh, not in favor of the peace talks with Taliban. He does not want Pakistan's uh, support or uh, say mediation. Uh, he has been asking the Americans to stay on. As you mentioned, he asked Indians 
to send a brigade to Afghanistan. I think the Indians are very clever, very smart. They will never do it. So I think that, you know, he is actually a spoiler, I must say. And as long as he's there and he speaks this, this kind of language, I don't expect any breakthrough in the peace process. Right. Uh, let's get to uh, Zayed Hassan here. Uh, Zayed Hassan, so uh, as Raimula uh, Zay is saying, uh, it's kind of inconceivable that the national security advisor will play off his own bat uh, unless uh, the, the president is, uh, you know, uh, on board. And in any case, we know that the president has not uh, chided him for, for the speech that he made in Nangraha. So does this mean that we are dealing with an Afghanistan official dispensation? which does not really have uh, much appetite for the peace process. Now, if that be so, could we also say that perhaps in terms of looking at the spoilers, we also need to move away from the Taliban and their entrenched position and also start looking at the Kabul government itself? It's all you're right, actually, that uh, Alhamdulillah, whatever Alhamdulillah has said, um, and he has been saying all this kind of thing, it's not the first time that he admits uh, uh, this kind of event, although it, it, has, it was the most, uh, you know, unacceptable uh, comment and unparliamentary. And I would go further, actually, that it, it, no one actually will, uh, no one of any responsible position would use those, do, those words. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you are right, actually, that it is not uh, his own views. It may be, uh, but it really reflects a certain thinking in Kabul government. And you are right, actually, that um, he has not been chided by, uh, by President Ghani. He has not been, actually, any, in any country, uh, this kind of statement would have made uh, him, uh, the, the official, to resign, but it did not happen. And it, it is not uh, the first time, as uh, Raimullah rightly mentioned, that he made exactly, not exactly the same comment, but uh, very nasty comments against the against uh, uh, Khalidat. And in fact, actually, and it all happened after Doha agreement. Uh, and what he, uh, they were very, uh, it was very clear that the Afghan government was not very happy with Doha agreement uh, between United States and, uh, and the Taliban. And so this, kind, this has created a situation where it has become very difficult for the two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan, to work together for peace in this region. And I think probably uh, one could also examine that some, some of the statements coming out uh, or given by President Ghani recently. You might have seen uh, uh, President Ghani's uh, interview in Terry Spiegel, which was published a few weeks ago. And in fact, actually, uh, it was all full of criticism of Pakistan, and it was also very undiplomatic some way, because some of the uh, some of the discussion which had taken place between uh, between President Ghani and uh, and Bajwa, it was all actually was uh, uh, he told everything to the interviewer, and it never happened. What whatever transpired in this kind of meeting is between the two countries. I think probably that has created a huge problem. That how could Pakistan? work together with Kabul government to have any kind of uh, political settlement in place. Uh, it's a very dicey situation, I would say. Right. Very happy that you talked about the, the Spiegel interview also. So, Raimullah used to say, uh, Zayn Sam has uh, added another, and, you know, I think I should have mentioned this in my opening also, because these are the two uh, incidents that have resulted in uh, cooling off of relations, uh, Ghani's The Spiegel interview and then, of course, Mohib's statement. Now, my question is that uh, the Americans are constantly asking us to, A, to, of course, to facilitate their withdrawal, but secondly, also to somehow facilitate the intra-Afghan dialogue. Now, in the event that you know, we see the Kabul government, very responsible people, the president and the national security advisor, behaving in ways that are not going to uh, build confidence between Kabul and Islamabad. So, what are our options uh, given this kind of reaction from Kabul? 
You know, I initially mentioned also President Ashraf Ghani's allegations against Pakistan. And I would say that uh, Alhamdulillah Mohib elaborated those uh, allegations. And he went a step further and uh, you know, used very uh, tough language, uh, very unparliamentary language against Pakistan. You don't do that, you know, with some with a country, with a neighboring country, uh, whose help you need for the peace process, and uh, which you sometimes praise and sometimes criticize. So my feeling is that Pakistan is in a dilemma. You know, the Americans keep asking us, sometimes they praise us, sometimes they ask us to do more regarding the peace process. Uh, the world government also, they think that we can do more, but we are not doing enough. Recently, you have, may have read the statement by the acting foreign minister, Ani Patma. He said, it is time to act. No longer do we just want statements and assurances by Pakistan. So, you know, I think the problem is they had to elaborate. What do they want? Do they want Pakistan to take action against the Afghan Taliban, expel them, hand them over to the Afghan government? You know, they should say it clearly. This is what they want, I think. Or they want us to put pressure on Taliban to make concessions, agree to a ceasefire, that kind of thing. You know, I think, uh, you know, I was in Kabul uh, some time back, and uh, I asked them, uh, there was an audience, I asked them that, uh, you know, please tell us, what do you want from Pakistan? And I also uh, asked Pakistan to explain its policy regarding Afghanistan. Because both countries blame each other, the blame game continues, and we still don't know what do the Afghans want and what does Pakistan want. I think Pakistan, we can say it with very uh, with confidence that peace in Afghanistan is in our interest. Peace in Afghanistan means that if Taliban become part of the system, uh, maybe they will stop fighting. Peace means that all anti-Pakistan elements in Afghanistan or other elements which are anti-Iran or anti-China, anti-Russia, even anti-America, uh, anti-West, they will don't, they won't get any refuge in Afghanistan. This is what we all want, and that should be the objective, I think. So we should maybe first uh, define as what what is the end game, and what has to be achieved, and how much role different countries have to play. Because after all, it is going to be a shared responsibility. No country alone can do this. Americans tried. NATO tried for the last 20 years and failed. That's why they are not talking sometime about regional involvement and regional connectivity. So that, I think, should have been done earlier instead of doing it now. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Rahimullah Yusuf Zai speaking with us. Uh, Zaid Hussain, uh, talking of uh, you know what the U.S. wants from Pakistan, uh, there are, there is now, you know, there is the New York Times story also with reference to looking for bases, which is essentially counterterrorism uh, capability. Now, your book, No Win War: The Paradox of U.S.-Pakistan Relations and Afghanistan's Shadow, traces this entire story beginning with the U.S. invasion. So, given the sort of, you know, uh, the details that you've mentioned in your book, uh, what do you think is likely to happen now uh, as far as U.S. Pakistan relations are concerned as the U.S. withdraws and then looks for a counterterrorism capability in the region? Um, uh, as we all know, that um, this illusion of uh, strategic relationship has gone all um, have long, long ago, and that uh, the relation between the United States and Pakistan for a very long time now has only been transactional. In fact, actually, uh, at certain points uh, when we, uh, during Trump's administration, when they started negotiation uh, with the Taliban, it became more of a transitory relationship. And I don't think that they have, uh, there is going to be any change 
uh, uh, non this relationship between the two countries, but uh, 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 terrorist group or militant group. So what are they going to do about it? Now they are looking for something, and they are not. They are not uh, I, mean, I always say that um, uh, the, uh, it is uh, American exit is as a chaotic as, uh, as it, uh, their invasion to Afghanistan, because they, came, they went into Afghanistan without a really clear strategy, and they left Afghanistan without any strategy. Now they are looking for some strategy, and they now need some kind of basic Iraq in the surrounding country uh, to actually keep a surveillance on Afghanistan situation. And that's what uh, you are just referring about the New York Times article that makes it very clear that America is already into negotiation on the, uh, on the basis with Pakistan and some other countries. Uh, well, Pakistan has made it policy very clear that they are not going to provide any basis to America, but uh, uh, it may not be so easy also. So let's see actually what happens. But I think Pakistan's, uh, it has increased Pakistan's dilemma. On one side, Pakistan was, uh, sounded very relieved that finally, with the withdrawal of American forces, and particularly uh, with the Taliban and America, the deal with America and Taliban, they felt that there's something can move forward now. But um, as, you, as we all know, Afghanistan is never peace in Afghanistan is never easy, and that's exactly happening now. That um, uh, that troops are leaving, our American troops are, are leaving without a political settlement in place in Afghanistan which is all the, the problem uh, we have already seen. There's a crisis-like situation. Uh, if, well, uh, a one national army has resisted, has resisted uh, the, uh, the Taliban on Salat to some extent. But could they do so after the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces? So that is a big question. Mark. Absolutely. And I think it's, So that makes Pakistan... Absolutely. And, and lack, of, lack of close air support also. Absolutely. Uh, stay with me. As I said, joining me now is Hamdullah Hamdan, an Afghan journalist and commentator. Mr. Hamdan, thank you for being on the program. We're discussing this statement by uh, your namesake, <laughs> Hamdullah Mohib, uh, the Afghan NSA, uh, in which he used, uh, uh, you know, uh, unparliamentary language also uh, against Pakistan. Uh, then uh, before that, there was this interview to Der Spiegel by the Afghanistan president, uh, Ashraf Khani. Uh, so my question is that uh, at the time when um, Afghanistan, when Kabul uh, also wants Pakistan to further facilitate the peace process, the Americans are also saying this, the Americans are also uh, relying on us for uh, peaceful withdrawal and the rest of it. Uh, do you think it's good strategy uh, on the part of Kabul government, very responsible people in the Kabul government, including the president and the NSA, to make such statements against Pakistan? Uh, well, first of all, uh, as an Afghan, uh, I personally prefer to have uh, friendly ties with all our neighbors, including Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, China, and the rest of the countries, uh, even the second-layer neighbors. Uh, and secondly, if I were to advise both uh, Qureshi and Mohib, uh, I would have asked them uh, to kindly stay honest to each other uh, and stop this blame game. Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan have been in trouble. I mean, they have been engaged in this Afghan war for a long time now. Uh, I guess that uh, we know that, uh, that the international community has also appreciated the role of Pakistan in bringing Taliban to the negotiating table. And the Afghan government has also asked uh, repeatedly the Pakistani government to support the Afghan government in this process and bring Taliban to the negotiating table of the peace talks. Uh, that, that, that cannot be rejected. I mean, the role of Pakistan cannot be rejected in this regard. However, the recent wars or the recent fights of Taliban in Helmand province or in Lagman province and some other provinces, we all know that the war or the uh, fight of Taliban against the National Army of Afghanistan, or against the national police, or even against the people who are working under the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, has escalated, and Taliban have escalated this war. But Pakistan did not play a role here to stop Taliban and at least uh, convince them not to go on the war strategy, or not to go for the war strategy, and go for the peace negotiation, 
in Doha in talk with the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. I believe that since the last 40 to 50 years, the war that has been uh, happening or the war that has continued in Afghanistan has never been in favor of Pakistan or Afghanistan or other neighboring countries. In order to have Pakistan in the favor or to get this in the favor of Pakistan, Pakistan should also try their honest struggles or their honest efforts uh, uh, and bring some pressure on the Taliban because now the world have acknowledged that Pakistan has great influence over the Taliban. It means that Taliban's shelters or residents are in Pakistan and Pakistan can have control over the Taliban leaders. They can convince the Taliban to go for the peace negotiation with the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, stop killing Afghans, and the NSA of pa Afghanistan, Hamdullah Mohib, and the rest of the government should also prefer to go for the peace talks instead of escalating the war uh, here in Afghanistan, the war between Taliban and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in the position to advise them, but if I were to advise them, I would have told them uh, to stop the blame game. It has been so long and it does not have any result, which is in the favor of both Pakistani nation and Afghan nation. Uh, these are two brother nations and they should live brotherly with each other. They should cement the friendly and diplomatic ties day by day and should avoid any kind of hatred or insult language, uh, both by Pakistan and by Afghanistan. And this should not happen again uh, uh, here in the region. It's not in the favor of anyone. Right. Um, I, I accept uh, the spirit in which uh, you have said this. But in fairness to uh, Mr. Shah Mahmood Qureshi, uh, the first salvo was fired by uh, Abdullah Mohib and he was responding to it. Uh, but uh, before I wrap up, uh, let me go back to uh, Zaid Hussain. Uh, Zaid Hussain, Hamdullah Hamdar has raised this issue about uh, how much influence Pakistan has over the Taliban. Uh, you know and I know and we've been talking to our sources also that we have already reached our ceiling as far as that influence is concerned. Now, secondly, there is the, the, this thing about uh, the Taliban uh, sanctuaries or residences I mean, there are uh, Taliban leaders also residing in Iran. Uh, lots of them are residing in UAE, elsewhere. Uh, so, so the point really is that uh, this, this ask that to pressure the Taliban, when Taliban hold better cards than any of the regional players, I mean, Taliban could actually link up with groups and the groups that are already based on Afghan soil and can launch a, and and are already launching attacks on Pakistan can launch further attacks on Pakistan so so there are limitations uh, uh, it seems to what Pakistan can do but I would certainly want to get your view on this before I wrap up just you are absolutely right that uh, Pakistan did have some kind of leverage on, on Afghanistan there's no doubt uh, on Taliban there's no doubt about that and uh, it's also we all know about it uh, uh, that many of the Taliban leaders had resided uh, their families resided in Pakistan uh, they are uh, uh, they are Talibans also because uh, you know lots of Taliban fighters uh, have their house their homes here too that, that's for that's uh, this obviously very open and and in fact, but uh, and that's one of the reason why they all, they uh, they were able to bring the Americans uh, Taliban to negotiating table to with Taliban uh, with with America. But in fact, uh, this, one should also understand it that Taliban have always wanted to talk to America. So there was not not much of an effort Pakistan had to make. Once the Americans indicated they were willing to do so, the Tal uh, Taliban joined the, uh, the negotiation. But as far as um, negotiation with Kabul government, there's, there's always a limit to what, can, what Pakistan can do. And particularly last two years, if you see, that um, and, uh, with, the with the greater international recognition of Taliban and many Taliban leaders having shifted to Qatar and as you mentioned that in other countries too, the Pakistan's leverage 
on uh, on Taliban to bring them on negotiating table has become much less now. I'm not saying that they don't have any uh, any leverage, but certainly it's not like that they can dictate terms to to the Taliban leadership, and uh, so there are also some problems there. So I think probably uh, by by uh, by blaming Pakistan for everything what happens in Afghanistan would not help. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, uh, what the Taliban feeling now at this point of time that they have upper hand militarily. Although they also know it very well that it will not be easy or not, uh, it will rather be impossible for them to take over Kabul militarily. Uh, but I think probably they, they have their own thinking, their own strategy that once they had consolidated their position, they would might come uh, to negotiating the table. But this kind of, uh, you know, yes, actually Pakistan is also is one country which will be affected most by the uh, uh, by any worsening of American situation. So it is not in Pakistan interest to keep, uh, to allow the fighting to continue or to help uh, uh, the fighting to continue. Their major interest would be that uh, uh, Taliban should join the mainstream uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, Pakistan has made it very clear that they will not accept any military uh, 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 you know, uh, a takeover of Afghanistan. And that has very clearly meant for Taliban that they will not accept uh, the restoration of Islamic Emirates as it was in 1990s. So I think probably, uh, uh, but, what, but what Afghanistan government is, I think should also understand that they are actually, their continuous criticism of Pakistan will not help. It will not force Pakistan to do what uh, it could not do. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was Zaid Hussain. Thank you also to Hamdullah Hamdad for his insights. This is all from In Focus this evening. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at Indus.news. Good night and goodbye.